computing is a defining feature of our modern life and indeed the bedrock of scientific discovery in almost every field. As layman users of computing technology, we've be grown to be dependent on computation to control almost every aspect of our life. From the running of our trains to our airports to our prolific uses of social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. However, there are only a few of us that has ever wondered what makes this monumental progress in technology possible? It would not be an exaggeration to say that Moore's law in the last 20 to 30 years has been the most fundamental innovation that has affected us. Of course, there are many innovations in the 20th century that has had profound effects on our lives. But Moore's law, more than any, deserves to be put on a pedestal for it has deeply and personally touched every one of our lives. The realization that computing po processing power doubles roughly every two years is what has enabled us to go from roughly 2,000 transistors on a single microprocessor in the 1970s to now more than one billion, a processor that you can purchase at any place right now. So back to that question, what makes this progress, this seemingly unstoppable progress in technology possible? Well, I'm here to tell you today that it is due to a technology we call lithography. Our ability to define at ever smaller degrees and to pattern the dimensions of the microelectronic circuitry that makes every processor possible. So let me talk to you about evolution of lithography, just a brief history of it. We started roughly in the 1970s in systems we called contact lithography, where, in, where the entire system was in contact with a substrate or a, uh, a silicon that we were trying to pattern. Uh, today we're using a system called, um, otherwise known as step and scan, where every field that you wish to expose, every microprocessor, every transistor that is designed is uh, exposed and then repeated, so on and so forth. We started at wavelengths in the order of 460 nanometer in the 1970s. In lithographers' terms, it was called G-line lithography. Today, we're at deep UV or 193 nanometers. Um, on the right side, you can get a glimpse of these tools that manufacturers such as Intel or Samsung or many others use. These are very heavy equipments. Uh, the lenses are designed uh, very precisely, kept in a pristine environment in a microfabrication facility or otherwise known as fab. Each tool costs something like 10 or 80 to 100 million dollars and a particular manufacturer might have 10 of these tools or 20 of these tools at their disposal so they, they can make, uh, they can realize the potential of uh, manufacturing in a high scale, uh, high volume manufacturing mode to make this a real business. Um, you, if you can look closely, you see that operators are gowned or donned in this type of uh, protective uh, clothing, not to protect them from the product, but to protect the product from the impurities produced by, by them. So uh, I'm just trying to get, give you an idea of how difficult this business is and how expensive it, it is getting to be able to make the progress that we're seeing today. So what is lithography, you may be wondering at this point. Optical lithography, in very simple terms, is the process of patterning. Patterning on a substrate, in this, term, in this case, uh, silicon, and to transfer those geometric patterns onto wafers or silicon um, through a predetermined design. The design is on a photo mask or a reticle. And then this is all trans transferred to a, a resist, a light sensitive material that interacts with light. And then we can basically uh, make devices. So what I just mentioned is realized in the picture you see on the right. You end up with lines and spaces, essentially the electronic circuitry uh, on a nanometer scale. And you have billions of these lines and spaces enabling you to make a transistor. Let me give you a basic processing sequence. Of course, there are many sequences in the semiconductor manufacturing that are critical, but lithography is by far the most difficult uh, because it pushes the limit of technology. 
you start with the substrate silicon, uh, basically dirt from earth. This whole industry is created from dirt. So that is what is so amazing about it. It's purified into crystalline form. It is devoid of any oxygen. It is then coated with this type of light sensitive, sensitive material called resist. The light travels to your design, your mask is exposed. Um, areas where the resist interacts with lights are stripped off in a developer chemical. And then, the, then you go through an etching process and then finally you strip off the resist. Again, you end up with an image like that under an electron microscope. So how do we do this, this imaging basics of this? The equations that describe this in very ter simple terms are the angular, angle of light, ref diffracted light from, from your mask related to the wavelength of light and your slit opening, your mask. Uh, a lithography, a job of a lithographer is to utilize multiple orders of diffracted light to capture as much information as possible. The more information you have, the better your resolution will be and the faster your computer will be at the end. So at the heart of it all is Riley's equation, uh, sort of related to the first equation, but more condensely describing the resolution um, or how precise your image is, and finally again, how fast your device will work to the wavelength of light and the numerical aperture. The numerical aperture is the size of your lens. You can think about it in simple terms. The wavelength of light is simple. It's the UV light that we use in 193 UV light. So you really have three choices, three fundamental choices in order to make progress. You can increase the numerical aperture, make bigger lenses, more expensive. You can reduce the wavelength of light or reduce this K factor, this fudge factor that you see a lot used in physics or other you know, electrical engineering and so, so on. It's these factors that have to do with the environment, the tool, the lens, everything. You want to be able to reduce it to improve the resolution. So this is the name of the game. Um, so let me talk about the first mode of progress, increasing numerical aperture. Numerical aperture is the maximum angle of diffracted light by the lens. When light goes through a slit, it's diffracted because it's a wave, and then you have these modes of diffraction, these dark spots and light spots. If you capture only the end, n equal one order of information, your resolution is not going to be good. So again, the, the key uh, idea here is to design lenses that are able to capture as much possible, as, as many diffracted orders of diff, uh, diffracted light as possible, the spatial frequency components of light. So in recent years at Intel and some other manufacturers, we introduced the concept of immersion, essentially putting ultra pure water between your lens and your substrate, the silicon. Intel was one of the first manufacturers that was able to produce this in 1268 technology, 32 nanometers, very effectively at very high yields. Um, thus being uh, roughly two to three years ahead of any other manufacturer such as Samsung, another leading manufacturer. We use water because it has a higher index of refraction and the index of refraction causes, your uh, causes higher numerical aperture as compared to air which has an index of refraction of one. So you're essentially ending up with a bigger lens but your lens is not really physically bigger, it appears to be that way. There is a large, there's a trade-off um, when you increase your numerical aperture. As everything in life, nothing is free. So you can think about this in sim simple, terms, simple terms like photography. When you zoom in on an image, you can capture a lot of information about that area that you're trying to take a picture of. But you lose the ability to resolve images at larger scale. So this is one of the challenges of just relying on numerical aperture to improve your resolution. So we do other things. Enhance K factor that I talked about, this fudge factor. You do this by basically source engineering, changing your mask from a conventional circular mode to these other modes, quadrupole, annular, playing tricks with the optics. The most effective way, the third way that you can basically make faster computers is, is reducing the wavelength of light. We're now working in a regime where the wavelength of light is 13 and a half nanometers to be introduced in the next few years by Intel in many computers that you will be able to purchase. And so this is getting very difficult because the wavelength of light is reducing. So how do we do that? 
Right now, Intel is working on this technology called deep ultraviolet, or EUV, extreme ultraviolet. These are sources that are plasma-generated sources, so there is a lot of energy, um, highly energetic gases involved. Um, the sources are, the photons are en energetic. When they hit the, your resist, the resist have, has to be able to withstand the flux or energy of these photons. So designing the new types of resist is a challenge for manufacturers. Your optics have to be very precise. Your lenses or your masks have to be very de defect free. Uh, your masks have to be pellicleless. There's nothing, can, nothing that can touch, is, touch the mask. So uh, this is becoming very difficult and challenging to do. So today I'm here to propose another way. And um, this is sort of hedging your bets because we've spent so much money and resources on EUV and it's becoming more difficult to sort of push the boundary of Moore's law, make that happen for the next generation. We ought to explore other technologies. One such example is nano lithography or nano imprint lithography where you're essentially designing these um, uh, masks that are on a nanoscale and they're a mold, they're a nanoscale mold. You push down this mold into a resist, you go through a series of steps such as soft lithography, thermal implant litho at room temperature. Here you have the advantage of not worrying about scattering, you don't have to have interference, you don't have diffraction because you're essentially making contact, these molds are making contact with the resist and this is all done at room temperature. So I'm proposing that manufacturers pursue this technology. Of course, there's many challenges with this technology as well, but there's nothing that we cannot overcome. It's just a matter of money and sinking more resources into this to make this truly happen. So let me conclude by saying a few words. Um, you've already got a grasp of what Moore's Law means. So as we reduce feature sizes, as we play with optics as we reduce the wavelength of light to be able to make devices faster, we're running into very fundamental limits. And these limits are determined by the laws of physics themselves. Um, there are, of course, more earthly laws. And those laws are the laws of diminishing returns. More expensive fabs, maybe fabs that are roughly about $10 billion every three years. More expensive equipment, massive tools, right? Um, more expensive, more cost, you know, more labor uh, in, terms of, in terms of research and development and sustaining this. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, is Moore's Law dead? Well, I vehemently believe Moore's Law is not dead. In fact, we've barely begun to scratch the surface in terms of the number of innovations we will be able to bring about into the marketplace in the next 20 to 30 years. In the next 20 to 30 year time horizon, uh, we will bear witness to some of more astounding number of innovations made possible by artificial in intelligence, uh, quantum computing, and uh, optoelectronics. This had, has led uh, many to speculate and use this very forum, the TED forum, to argue that we are on the verge of singularity. A singularity is essentially uh, a summation of our scientific knowledge doubling roughly every hour, every day, by 2050, rather than every two years. This is a bold idea, but if we believe we are on an exponential, exponential curve of progress, this will indeed happen. And in the 20th century, we've seen that we are on exponentially growing our technology. So, on a more philosophical footing, what does it mean when you say Moore's Law is dead? What does it mean when you ask that? When you're asking that, what you're really questioning or asking is human ingenuity dead? Is human curiosity dead? Well, I firmly believe as homo, homo sapiens, we've never lacked ingenuity or curiosity. Ever since we set sail from the northern plains of Africa and expanded our species to other continents, we've always been explorers of our world, of our universe the world of the very large. Today, we're exploring the world of the very small, the nanoscale, the molecular scale, the atomic layer. Finally, what does this mean for our society? What does it mean for us? 
Well, com computing is pervasive and it's here to stay. There is no going back. Societies that are able to push the emblem of progress are able to embrace progress, are able to not only even embrace it but contribute, it, contribute to it are, will be the societies that will be successful. As nations, we have a duty to, co to contribute to a body of scientific knowledge. And if we do that, if we expand our scientific knowledge, we will be able to not only control the marketplace of ideas, but also control the marketplace itself. Thank you very much.